wonderful to be back with you again and to see your faces. And uh, I guess for many of you, welcome back into the corporate gathering you've been watching online. And I know there are people still watching online. And I do believe that God will touch you in this place or at home right now, today. We've already sensed His presence in the atmosphere. When you were saying that, I feel God, I felt God in the worship. I felt Him in the prayers. I felt Him in your faith when you called the sick. I felt Him in the tongues and the interpretation of tongues. I sensed the presence and the power of God. And it's not going to diminish. I believe that we will see God continue to move in the Word and in the ministry time later on. Um, people say, I'm fearless. I'm bold in the Lord. I wrote a book called Bold. And um, the, the righteous are as bold as a lion. And one day I was attacked by a lion that came running towards me. And I had the choice to die for cover or to keep taking photos. And I just kept taking photos until it stopped three foot from me and then backed away. So I am bold. I am brave. But I, at times I could be stupid as well. Uh, the theme is the move of the Spirit, and it just happened because I was meant to be a much earlier in the year, and of course because of this corona uh, virus and the restrictions that were placed on the church, we had to cancel and postpone, and we set this day just in faith not really knowing that we'd even be operational, and yeah, we are, and the attendance is great. God bless you for coming out, and I trust that you will come out, um, you know, the rest of the meetings tonight at 6.30. The, the flyer said 6 o'clock, but it's actually 6.30, but come at 6, that's good, and we'll do the graduation and then ministry time, and then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 7, and it's going to be a little different because, you know, um, and I had to smile because pastor said, now, you can't lay hands on the people, but you are laying hands on the people. And I thought, that's just like the government. You can go to Walmart, but you can't go to church. <laughs> they can hand you food, and they touch it, but we can't hand out an offering basket. I mean, some of these things just astound me. You know what I'm saying? But I, I respect and go with the flow. Uh, it's going to be a little different, but I want to share for you uh, a, a quick example, because typically I'm going to lay hands on everyone that moves, and if you're not moving, I'm going to come after you anyway, because <laughs> I'm bold and fearless, respectful but bold. And uh, so, uh, you know, I was thinking of where, where the Roman centurion who was um, marveled by Jesus for great faith, he said, all you have to do is speak the word. Because the very word carries the very presence and the power of God. And there is no limitation. Uh, the servant was lying at home. I don't know how far the home was from where Jesus was standing with that Roman centurion. But at the, the faith of that man... And the word that was in the heart and the mouth of Jesus, the servant was healed. I believe tonight, today in these meetings, even though I may not be able to lay hands on you, the word is going to be a carrier of the presence and power of God. My faith is in that. My faith is that there is no uh, geographic limitation. Those who are watching right now, even the presence of God that is in here, in this place, tangibly touching you where you are right now. I believe it's possible. I was doing meetings in Puerto Rico many years ago. It was, it was wild. Any Puerto Ricans here? Okay, I can be brutal with you. <laughs> Puerto Rico, those people are so free. I mean, they just jump in boots and all right from the beginning. The glory of God started to fall in the meeting, and I, I was never even introduced. 
What happened is, just like you were about to introduce me, and this is something you can grow into, you can get that kind of anointing that will just, you're going to get there. Just kidding. I was being introduced, they couldn't even pronounce my name, they called me Leon Van Rugen. Van Rugen, Leon Van Rugen. And they were introducing me, and the glory started to hit the people. And it started with my translator, um, because, uh, and it was weird. Because I got there, the pastors couldn't speak English, and of course, I can't speak Spanish. Well, now I can. I'm quite fluent. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco. Um, but back then, I couldn't even ask for café con leche. Uh, but they introduced me, and I got there because a woman in my meeting in St. Petersburg, Tampa, Florida, St. Pete, was touched by God, she began to violently shake, and she shook for seven days. In the beginning, people were laughing and happy. She was shaking under the power of God. But when they got to the first, the end of the first day, they started to freak out. By the seventh day, they had her in the emergency room, and she was an RN, one of the leading RNs in the hospital, so the doctors knew her. And when the doctors did a scan on her, the doctor came back to her and said, this is a miracle. She said, what do you mean? She had rods implanted in her spine. She had been in a vehicle accident. She had metal rods implanted to, in her spine. And as she shook, those rods disintegrated and passed out of her body. She was healed and made whole perfectly in her spine. Well, she was from Puerto Rico, and she phoned her ex-pastors, Hector and Evelyn Perez, and said, you've got to have this healing evangelist from South Africa. So they invited me, and I said, I'm not really an evangelist. I'm a revivalist, and, and God moves in different ways than just divine healing, though people are healed. And they didn't understand me. Come, come. So I got on a plane. This is weird. My luggage was lost. I'm a surfer. So I'm in board shorts, flip-flops. I'm going to Puerto Rico. Give me a break. I'm not going there in a three-piece suit. I'm T-shirt, flip-flops, board shorts. I get off the plane. My luggage doesn't arrive. <laughs> they lend me a suit. Puerto Ricans are smaller than me. My suit's set up here. The jacket barely got over my huge 44 chest and shoulders. They gave me a suit for a skinny little short guy. I had a, a it was like an orange tie with a green shirt and like a beige suit and flip-flops. I looked like I'd come out of the 60s or the early 70s. It was ridiculous. Anyway, <laughs> so I get up on the stage and my interpreter starts screaming, I'm on fire, I'm on fire, I'm on fire, and he goes out under the power of God. So they call someone else to come, and the person comes up to grab the mic off the ground where this guy's lying, but he reminded me of a deer in the headlights. His eyes were this big, he was already freaking out. <laughs> so he grabs the mic, and he looks at me. I still haven't said a word, and the power is hitting people. And they've been hit. They're falling out. They're rolling on the ground. They're screaming. They're crying. People are running and shouting. All heaven has touched them. And he's standing, and he's about to say whatever I'm going to say, and I've said nothing. And he goes out under the power of God. The mic goes rolling. So Hector uh, calls another one. They come even more freaked out than the second one. And they go out. He didn't even, he goes and bam, and he's on the ground. So another one, a lady comes and she's like, <laughs> and she just stood there. She didn't go out. But there was such a move of God. So this interpreter he is well connected in Puerto Rico, so he gets me on radio and on TV. And the glory that's in the meeting starts to hit people 
even on the radio, driving in their cars, some of the people phoned in and they said, we had to pull over because we were going out under the power of God. One man said, I felt drunk. I had to pull over in case I got arrested for drunk driving. And people were being hit in their homes. So I'm believing for you right now, whether you hear or at home, that the glory of God will touch you. But rather be here, if you can. Rather be here. Mike and Debbie just fly in from Missouri. They're watching. They're my friends. <laughs> Come on. We're going to extend our faith for you in the house and for those that are at home or watching wherever they're at. Um, the glory of God is not limited by time or by space. The Word is a carrier of the glory of God. So even as we start this first session, I want to start by praying for you in this place and for you at home. And I want you to put your hand on your belly. Uh, why your belly? Because the Scripture says out of your belly or out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. I was praying in one church. I said, put your hand in on your belly. And I prayed. I said, God, I'm asking you for an expansion in their lives. And one guy gave me a look like looks can kill. And he said to me afterwards, I don't want to be expanded in my belly. I'm already expanded enough. <laughs> I said, I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about an expansion of faith, of anointing, of love, and of power. So how many of you want to be greatly enlarged in your capacity for God today? Hallelujah. Lord God, as we place our hand on our bellies, on our innermost being, we believe for an invasion of your holy glory to fill each and every life in this place and those that are watching right now and even those that will watch recordings. God, touch them, I pray. Fill them. Oh God, let the shaking begin. Let the falling begin. Let the shouting begin. Let the dancing begin. Let the, the running begin. As people get hit by your power, let your healing increase if physically, spiritually, mentally, socially, relationally. Everything Thing that people are facing. There is no limitation to faith and to your word. God, send your word, send your power into their lives and out of their innermost being. Let that not be a trickle. Let it not be a stream, but let it be rivers, O oh God, that flow and uh, heal and deliver and refresh and awaken and bring to the cutting edge of what you want to do in their lives today and through this week. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Now just receive it in Jesus' name. Come on, press, 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 press into the glory. More, let the power of God flow into you. That's right. Pull it, pull it. Be like the pastor said, Jesus passing by with that desperation that was in that woman. Lay a hold of that garment right now. Activate your faith for a holy release of God's power into your life and into your body. In Jesus' mighty and glorious and wonderful and magnificent name. Hallelujah. 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 Let's give God a shout of praise. Come on. Even at home, just give Him a shout of praise. Freak your kids out. Woo! Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on at home. Someone shout loud enough that your dogs go running under the couch. <laughs> or start barking back at you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sometimes we... We say we're Pentecostals, but we act like we're just like barely saved, you know. And I was thinking we were singing, we'll dance a thousand miles. Some people aren't even getting in their car and drive five miles. Give me a break. Sometimes we're the biggest hypocrites in the world. We'll dance a thousand miles. We won't even drive five miles to get to church because it's raining outside. <laughs> Is that too harsh for you? Just come on. We've got to be real with these things. You know, I, I am unashamedly Pentecostal, not by denomination, but by being in the upper room of God's glory. I'm a citizen of the upper room. Hallelujah. 
I wasn't in that meeting, but I was an encounter with the same breath that filled them in that, when there came a sound from heaven and filled that room, that sound filled my life. And that fire sat on my life. And we're not the recipients of some watered down Holy Spirit. We're not recipients of some Holy Spirit that's gone on retirement. Hallelujah. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the Spirit of Pentecost. The Spirit that filled Smith Wigglesworth. The Spirit that filled Amy Simple McPherson and uh, men and women in history that we have seen in great revivals. The Spirit of God that fell on Saul. The Spirit of God that fell on Peter, James, and John and those in the upper room is the same Spirit of God that is the Spirit of Pentecost that you have received. Hallelujah. Someone give God a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that you're not getting some Holy Spirit that's 2,000 years older that can no longer move? Jesus said, the works that I do, you shall do also. He didn't say that to put us in a place of impossibility. He gave us hope. He gave us a word that we can experience the same glory that flowed through Him will flow through them and flow through us to this day until Jesus returns. Hallelujah. The Spirit-filled life or the Pentecostal life. Pentecostal is not that you shout amen in church. The true Pentecostal is one that is is Spirit-filled. When I use the Spirit-filled word, and you've heard me say this on previous visits, I I much prefer using the word God-possessed. God-possessed. God-filled. Or as your pastor described, the bottle of water that's overflowing. It's not just to the cap. It's overflowing. My cup runs over the extravagance of God. We are not operating from the dregs of the bottom of the barrel, but with the overflow of God's love and power and light to our generation. Hallelujah. God possessed, spirit filled, is the normal Christian life. It's not limited to uh, an experience 15 years ago, 20 years ago. It's a daily walk that we have in God. It is our life in Christ Jesus. The Spirit-filled life is the normal Christian life. It's not for when we have tongues and interpretation. It is for every minute of every day of your life. We are to be filled with the Spirit, led by the Spirit, empowered by God. This is normal Christian living. Now, I'm not saying that unless you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're not saved. You're saved by the blood of Jesus. You're saved by the grace of God. You're saved because you called on the name of the Lord. You're not saved because you speak in other tongues. You're not saved because you were touched by the power of God and fell to the ground and shook and you were healed. That doesn't make you saved. What makes you saved is the work of the cross. Because one died for all. And when he died, he took your place. And when you heard the gospel, the good news, and that word penetrated your spirit, faith was activated inside of you. And you said, Jesus, from a believing heart, be the Lord of my life. If you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. He didn't say you'll speak with other tongues. He said you'll be saved. He didn't say you'd fall to the ground and shake for seven days and then you're saved. No, that simple act of faith that Jesus died for me, took my place, rose again from the dead, and I call upon that name, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. From that moment on, you're saved. But that's entry. That's where it begins. Then there are other steps that need to be taken. You must be, as a believer, baptized in water. That is the step of obedience to the Word of God. Water baptism doesn't save you, but it's a step of obedience that is essential. 
And I believe it's important. If you don't take that step of identification with the burial and resurrection, it's not that you are diminished in your salvation, but you are diminished in your ability to mature. Because you're starting out your Christian life already disobeying the Word of God. Soon it will become a pattern for you. And so you want to obey God straight away. Don't let religious tradition get in your head and say, well, I was christened, therefore I don't need to be baptized. Being christened as your parents in, uh, in their simple childlike faith dedicated you to the Lord. And you are actually now the product of that dedication. So it's not insulting your parents and it's not insulting your Christian traditional upbringing. But now that you are born again, you should be baptized in water. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or in the name of Jesus, you get baptized, you come out, and heaven sees it, demons see it, the church sees it, and you see it. It's an act of identification. It's an act of faith. It's important. That doesn't save you, just like speaking in other tongues doesn't save you. But it's important. And then you should position your life before God and say, God, I want to be filled with your Spirit. Because it is essential for your life to be empowered. Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. And I want to get it, go in your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 1. Jesus has died and he has been raised from the dead. And he then meets with the disciples, the apostles that had deserted him, and he's encouraged them, and he's restored them, and he meets with many others in those days. And then in the verse 4 of Acts chapter 1, and being assembled together with them, he, being Jesus, the resurrected Christ, commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For truly, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Notice that he commanded them to stay. They were already the recipients of the indwelling Spirit because Jesus had breathed upon them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Remember? He breathed on them, so they had the indwelling of the Spirit. But he said, I want you to stay. In fact, it's not a suggestion. This isn't like Jesus said, hey guys, I know you're all busy. I know we've got things going on. There's a lot of pressure on your life. If you can somehow accommodate this little request. He said, I command you. Can you imagine the commandment, the authority in those words? I command you to stay in Jerusalem. That's not a suggestion. Some people live thinking that the word of God is suggestions. This is a command. It is imperative for our lives. Stay in Jerusalem. Why? Because he had taught them. He had trained them. He had shaped them. He had molded them for three years. But they needed the empowerment of the Spirit. They needed to be activated into the possibility and the potential of what God had in mind through them. Which he has in mind through you and those that are watching right now. This was not limited to that generation. This upper room experience, this commandment to stay in Jerusalem is for every believer. There has to be a place of empowerment for our lives. There has to be a, a time of empowerment for our lives where we are positioned in humility in hunger and desire and faith before God to receive what He's got for us. I said I'm unashamedly Pentecostal. When I was saved just a, a few days, um, I, being a surfer, unafraid of shocks, I made it my habit 
to pray without ceasing. But specifically before bed, I would just get on my knees. I don't know. I just like praying on my knees. I would kneel down at the couch. I had a, do you call it a couch? Sofa. I would kneel down at my couch. It was the color of the suit and shirt that I wore in Puerto Rico. It was like a mustardy orange color from the 70s. It's very cool. And, and it was beautiful and long. And my kitten had got on the corners and scratched it. So it was brand new couch, but it was already scratched to pieces. And there's a story about that kitten, which I think I told you because I, the watch and pray became a reality to me. Someone, I didn't know about demons. I, I thought they were like, you know, in my ignorance, they're like parables. They, they mythological stories that are somehow embedded in the Bible showing us good and evil. And then when I got saved, this dear man who was discipling me taught me about the reality. We, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principality and power. And, and I'm not afraid of great white sharks, but I freaked out about the possibility of demons walking around my house. <laughs> so I knelt down at that same couch that I was now going to tell you the story. I knelt down at that same couch to pray. And I looked around thinking, I hope there's no demons in this place that are going to somehow attack me. And I knelt down and I, for a split second, because once I heard about demons, I watched and prayed. And then I closed my eyes for a split second. And this demon from hell jumped on my back and started to claw me. I jumped up. I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And my little kitten went flying through the air. <laughs> Every time that kitten saw me after that, it would go. <laughs> <laughs> it would arch its back. Well, that kitten had torn the sides of the couch. And now, a few days later, I'm at that same couch kneeling to pray. And this was my prayer. I said, Lord, I want all that you've got for me. I was genuinely born again. My life was a new creation, brand new beginnings. But I knew there was more. I didn't know what that more was. I didn't even know about speaking in other tongues. I didn't know about baptism in the Spirit. In fact, I didn't even know about water baptism. When someone suggested I be baptized in water, I said, no, I've been christened as a child. I don't need to be baptized. So you can see I was ignorant, brother. I knew nothing. So I get down to pray. I said, Lord, I'll, I want all that you've got for my life. And when I finished praying, I went to bed. And about 2 o'clock in the morning, as I was asleep, there came a sound from heaven. It filled that room and filled the room of my heart. And that invading power hit me while I was asleep. And I sat up speaking in other tongues. And the glory of God was in my room. I didn't know what that was. But I heard myself speaking in this language. It was not that I was like uninvolved. I'm in faith. I'm already speaking in other tongues while I'm asleep. Waking up with the power of God. My life was radically changed at that moment. Six o'clock that morning, I had reached my first soul. Because the Bible says, you shall receive power to be a witness. I didn't know about speaking in tongues. I didn't know that I could speak in tongues again. Or, and again and again, I didn't know that I had an access to speak to God. Mysteries bypassing the limits of my mind. I didn't understand any of that. But something happened to me. I had an upper room experience where I was activated and empowered by God. And the evidence was not just tongues, but was power in my life. I became a radical evangelist, reaching souls, reaching my generation, reaching other uh, surfers and who were ministering on the streets to drug addicts and, and, and into bars and into uh, uh, places where no one would go. And, uh, and so that experience, that upper room experience was mine. 
And I didn't know about Acts chapter 1, where Jesus commanded them to stay in Jerusalem. That bedroom, that living room where I knelt down to pray was my Jerusalem. Because from Jerusalem, I could go into the highways and the byways. I could go to Judea, Samaria, the outermost parts of the earth. But I had to stay in Jerusalem for an empowerment. And I thank God for that day, that two o'clock in the morning experience. It was pivotal to who I am today as a leader in the church, as a man of God. That's why I say I'm unashamedly Pentecostal because I've been in the upper room. What they got, I got. What they received, I received. The same spirit, the same fire that sat on them sat on me. The same wind that blew into that room blew into my life. And if you are the recipient of the baptism in the Spirit, we should be forever grateful for that Jerusalem experience. Now, we don't just stay in Jerusalem. There's a world to reach. But we've got to have a place where we are activated and empowered by God. Does that make sense to you? He commanded them. Why? Because he wanted them to become the recipients of the promise of the Father. Jesus had already spoken to them. We are anchored in the word of promise. We're not asking for something when we want to be spirit-filled that, that is limited to preachers, to missionaries. This is for every believer, for every believer, for every generation. This is God's will for our lives. Paul wrote to the Ephesians and he said, Do not be drunk with wine wherein is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. When he said be filled with the Spirit, the, 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 the text of that actually means in your being filled, stay being filled. And it was in the imperative. In other words, this is vital for your life. And I think of Mark 16. These signs shall follow them who believe. But what is the sign? One of the signs is they'll speak with other tongues. That means they will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And when Paul came to them in Ephesus, he said, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? They said, What Holy Spirit? They were like me, the young surfer who didn't even know about a Holy Spirit. Well, those days they called the Holy Spirit the Holy Ghost, which freaked me out. Ghosts and demons freaked me out. So when someone said the Holy Ghost, I thought, oh my goodness, I want a ghost around. I didn't understand the Trinity of God. The very thought of ghosts and demons, like I said, I watched and prayed without ceasing. But I discovered that this is available for every believer. This was available for me. This commandment that he gave to them wasn't just to them. It's for every one of us. Be filled with the Spirit is the normal Christian life. It's not for the missionary, the apostle, the evangelist, the pastors, teachers. It's for every believer. We are a Spirit-filled people. We're not just saved from hell to make heaven, but while we're on earth, we are to be God-filled or God-possessed or Spirit-filled or baptized in the Holy Spirit. This is the normal Christian life. It's not limited to a Pentecostal denomination. It's not your denomination that determines your spirituality. This Spirit-filled life is for every believer, no matter what denomination they're in. This is the normal Christian life. This isn't weird. If we've been evil give good gifts to our children, good gifts, like food, sustenance, supply, how much more will He not give the Holy Spirit? In other words, this is a good gift. This isn't some weird experience limited to a denomination of weird people. I'm not calling you weird. Well, some of you may be a little... This. <laughs> But that's what people think about Pentecostals. When I was young, before I was even saved, they used to speak about Pentecostal churches. They'd say, don't go there. They catch the Holy Ghost. They catch the Holy Ghost. I thought, I want to be in a church where they catch ghosts. They lock the door and switch off the lights and catch the Holy Ghost. 
So when I was invited to go to a Pentecostal church, I, I didn't know it was Pentecostal until I drove there and saw. I said, I won't go in that place. They're weird. He said, the, the man who invited me, I said, he said, why are they weird? I said, they lock the door, they switch off the lights, and they catch the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I'd never been in one. I just had it handed down to me from generation to generation. Those people are weird. And people think we're weird because we raise our hands or we dance before God or we shout or we say amen. They think it's weird because in their Christian upbringing, they never experience it. But if you read the Bible, you may actually find that we full gospel, that we are Genesis to Revelations that we believe the Bible to be an inspired Word of God, and this is our truth, this is what we believe, and this is what we practice. This isn't something that is just a, a limited people that have had access to this little revelation that is borderline weirdness. This is acceptable because it's biblical. Jesus Himself said, you must have this, so important is this, stay in Jerusalem. I command you. People want to accommodate this in their Christian experience and then just kind of move on again and have, say, well, I'm spiritful, rabba, 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 and they have a prayer language. To be God-possessed means to be filled with the Spirit of God, led by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, operating in the gifts and the anointings of God. This isn't so that we can just have a prayer language. This is so that we can reach our generation. Reach your world. There's a whole world around you. You can't do that. Just like the apostles and the disciples that sat under the exact immediate teachings and ministry of Jesus saw Him in miraculous power. They needed the source of His power to do what He wanted them to do. And we need that as well. I've come to the end of my time to minister. I've got to somehow try to bring this in in the next few minutes for you. And so he said, this is the promise. This is a promise. Promises are good. How many of you remember the phrase that we used to say, every promise in the book is mine. Well, he has a promise that is yours. <laughs> this is a promise in red letter. This is a promise from the promise himself. Saying, this is something God wants you to have. Like Paul, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you received the Holy Spirit? I'm not talking about indwelling, born again. Have you received the empowerment of the Spirit since you believed? What Holy Spirit, they said. Because they hadn't been taught or trained in that, just like I'd been in church as a kid. Confirmation, went through the whole process, could take communion. I didn't even know there's a Holy Ghost other than in the, the phraseology of it. I didn't understand that the Holy Spirit can fill my life, lead me, speak to me, direct me. I can commune and fellowship with Him. I had no idea about those things. How many of you remember in your ignorance you didn't know that now it's our everyday language because we've grown up in the Word of God, but there was a time when we didn't know these things. If you don't know these things, don't feel bad. Welcome to the, to the club that I have come out of, the club of ignorance. Being, ignorance. being ignorant of something, you know, they say ignorance is bliss. It robs you of what God wants for your life. This is the normal Christian life. God wants you to be God-filled, God-possessed, Spirit-filled, Spirit-empowered, and He wants you to receive the promise of the Father. Now, what I've learned in um, churches is there are many Christians that have spoken in other tongues, but they've struggled. They've stayed there in 15 years ago, 20 years ago, they've not moved, they've not grown in the dimensions of operating in the Spirit. Many people are anchored just in the upper room. They've never gone outside of the upper room experience 
of the speaking in other tongues. Uh, that's where they stay. And uh, of course, Jesus commanded them to stay in Jerusalem, but not permanently. Even though we live out of that experience, we have to then take what we get in the upper room, straight after the upper room, 3,000 souls were saved. It went from the room to the streets. It goes from the upper room to your family, to your neighborhood, to your generation as God opens doors and leads and directs you so you have opportunity to express what happens in the upper room. Not only that, but God gives you gifts and abilities for the ministry in the church, just like we had tongues and interpretation. That is the, the gifts of the Spirit in operation, the vocal gifts. There are power gifts, there are revelation gifts, and there are vocal gifts. So being Spirit-filled is not just the power to reach the lost, but it's the power to operate in gifts and abilities in church meetings, and then being led by the Spirit to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to minister to people prophetically. Just like we were talking in the car driving from the airport, prophetic evangelism. God gives you a specific word, leads you a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, a, word, a, a discernment of spirit. And so you start to minister to people just like Jesus at the well when that woman was speaking to him about living water, he said, the man that you're with is not even your husband. It was a word of knowledge, but that would activate her spirit and position her for salvation. And then out of that revelation, she goes and says to the, all the men in the, in the city, come see a man who told me everything. Why? Because he operated in the dynamics of the spirit. And the way that he ministered, you can minister as well. Hallelujah. So it's not just limited to church experiences, but even in your life, God can give you a word. I was speaking to a, a surgeon the other day who's on fire, Haitian surgeon. She's a, um, in New York working in emergency rooms with all this COVID going around. But she lays hands on her patients, casts out demons, and heals the sick. You understand? She's led by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, and people are getting healed and raised up without surgery because she hears from God and she does what God tells her to do. In the same way, you can be activated. So if you've neglected your walk in the Spirit, we can refresh and revive and awaken. And that's what these next few days is all about, is bringing you to the cutting edge of what God wants to do in and through your life. So this morning is kind of foundational, and then tonight, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we'll pick up on this, where I started today in being filled with the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, being empowered by the Spirit.